So today we continue the theme on uh, perfecting holiness and the theme we take based on God's word unto us uh, through the prophet uh, and the warning that was delivered last week was to be holy. Remember that how the book of Ezekiel was read and uh, there's a call to holiness primarily also because in the seven thunders prophecy those who don't walk in holiness, judgment will come very fast. Those who don't walk in righteousness, judgment comes very fast. It's going to be faster than normal. That's the first thing. Secondly, there's going to be a lot of severe judgment from God. We should thank God uh, when, uh, when uh, in fellowship there is uh, helping and uh, helping people, uh, judging one another to push one another further or when the judgment comes through human beings who are uh, in spiritual positions, whether they be a prophet, apostle, or leader uh, in the church. Because when judgment comes from God in the seven thunders, it's more severe than any human will dispense. And so, out of the mercy of God to preserve us, the warning is always given first. And that's why we embark on this teaching series on perfecting holiness. And the title is actually taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Chapter 7, yes, I did. Chapter 7, verse 1. He says that, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the spirit, of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And um, we will talk about filthiness in the flesh and spirit in this series, what he identifies. Uh, but our theme is perfecting holiness. And uh, that's the serious theme on this message, perfecting holiness. And as we read out the theme and embark on the first part, there will be part one this morning, part two in the afternoon, and so forth. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we come because you are our love. You are our first love. You are our first fear too. We fear only you. We fear not demons. We fear not any other being. Although we do have respect uh, for all the angels that you assigned to us, we do have respect for men and women of God and people who you appointed in armies with very gift things and through the body of Christ. Uh, Father, you are our love. At the same time, you are our only fear. And walking in the fear of God, of holiness, of righteousness, we ask that you teach us. Especially in this seventh understanding, you see our heart. See our desire. See our aspirations. You see our life from beginning to end. You see where we have walk closely where we have not walked closely, where we have walked righteously where we have not, where we have walked in holiness where we have not. You see our strength and our weakness. And as we enter into this phase by which you are quickening the seven thunders, when judgment comes speedily, when judgment comes more severely, we ask of God that we may understand these truths and not just understand them, but perfect them, absorb them, walk the walk, talk the talk, live the life that you want us to live. Most of all, that we will become more and more like Jesus. We ask, O oh Father God, that you will reveal these things into our heart and our life. And Father, establish your righteousness in our life. Establish your holiness in our life. And we ask for the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation. Open our eyes that we may see. 
And let it be specially in, in this message I ask for a special anointing. That as the message is brought forth by your Spirit, let there be conviction by the Holy Spirit of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Whatever it may be, open our eyes. Let your light shine even clearer and brighter and stronger through these words. Let it shine so bright that we may all see ourselves not as we see ourselves, that we may see ourselves not as others see us, that we may see ourselves the way you see us. For only Yahweh is righteous, only Yahweh is holy. And only you can reveal holiness and righteousness. We dare not compare one with another who are more holy, who are more righteous. But we only compare to you. You are the source of holiness. You are the source of all righteousness. We ask that this light be revealed as your word is spoken. And we welcome you, Holy Spirit. All seven spirits that flow from the throne of God. We welcome your Holy Spirit to manifest through this word and through this message the holiness of God. To convict us. To bring us into the righteousness and holiness of God. Open our hearts and our minds. Thank you Father God. In Jesus name and everyone say Amen. Now let's start where we have more or less have established a platform from the book of Romans 5. We need to first of all reiterate the difference between righteousness and holiness. And uh, righteousness by definition relates to the laws of God. These laws are laws that govern his universe. There are laws in regard to his spirit beings and how they do things. Laws in regard to the angels and how they work. Laws in regard to his creation and how it is to function. The natural laws, spiritual laws. There are laws that govern uh, when he, this earth, when he released humans to populate the earth, and we all know there are moral laws, social laws, and uh, various laws of relationship with God, laws regarding everything that we contact. And uh, because all these multiple laws will weigh us down if we try to be too conscious of that, the whole thing is summarized under the words righteousness, which is a right relationship with everything. There's a right relationship to yourself. There's a right relationship to food. How much food? Not too much food. Uh, uh, and uh, So, uh, food can be good. Uh, and not enough food yields starvation, malnutrition. Too much food yields indulgence and uh, gluttony. And so, uh, in everything we have a right and wrong relationship. And uh, the essence of it is not uh, in the food in itself. Because food in itself was created to do good. But our relationship to it may make it better good. Money has been said to be the root of all evil. But money by itself is neutral. Because if money in itself is a personification of evil, then we all cannot touch or handle money. So money in itself is an invention of a system by which we could measure economic value. But how we handle it, the Bible never says money is the root of all evil. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. So the wrong relationship with mammon is what causes unrighteousness. And Jesus warned about mammon in his Sermon on the Mount. And so, there is a right way we handle money, there's a wrong way we handle money. 
and hinderly wrongly is unrighteousness, hinderly rightly is righteousness. So you can say righteousness has to do with relationship. Relationship to the right of handling things, handling people, there's a way to handle people, there's a way to do things, there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. There are many, many, and all these are tied under righteousness. And the Bible says in the book of Romans 3, they are not righteous. You may be righteous in one area, you fail in another. And no human has ever been perfect in righteousness. Because we are like little kids, we don't know everything. We don't know every law. And you might know some areas, but you're ignorant of other areas. As a result, we all condemn that even if you fail in one area of uh, righteousness, you have become unrighteous and it is sin in the sight of God. And uh, so Romans chapter 3 condemns all that is not righteous. There's only one righteous, our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And when our Lord Jesus Christ uh, came and died on the cross for us, Second Corinthians 5 verse 21 tells us, He became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. So finally, we have a revelation of God's righteousness to us. So we start with Romans 5. When knowing that we cannot be righteous in our own way. You see, righteousness is so complex, there's so many things, so many areas. In the end, how are we going to progress? It will take us a thousand years to learn every law, every nuances of uh, little things. And so God, through Jesus, shortcut the process. He gave you the gift of righteousness. So that inside each one of us, we have a sense of right and wrong beyond the normal conscience. The world has its conscience. And that conscience has been polluted through sin nature, tainted through sin. And so, even right now out in the world, there are good people out there, there are bad people out there. They are living by, based on their conscience. So obviously there's a conscience. But we know conscience alone was not enough to set humans free. It's like the book of Judges. Every man does what is right in his own sight. And then, if every man does what is right in their own sight, it was still a horrible world. Because one person's sense of righteousness is different from the other. And one may deem some things right, the other deem the other wrong. And notice that inside each one of us is a desire to be right and a desire to be seen to be right. People argue because they say this is right and that is right. Why do we feel emotions when it comes to being right or wrong? Why do we feel emotions when we feel we have been wrong? Because inside us, we have been built for righteousness. If we have not been built for righteousness, when wrong occurs, you won't feel anything. It is rather we've been built for righteousness. And God knows this. And He knows that the concept of righteousness is too complex for our mind and our intellect to grasp everything. So, He gives us the gift of righteousness with Romans 5 tells us. He gives us a shortcut process and says in verse 17, Romans 5 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So you may ask, okay, now that I have the gift of righteousness, and this is what people see wrongly. People think that the gift of righteousness is just so that we can come before God. No, the gift of righteousness is so involved the righteousness. So that that gift which is a seed into our life will become the fruit of righteousness. And that gift of righteousness is, to put it in another way, is God giving you the ability to know or to sense. No might. When I use the word know, people think it's just intellectual knowing. No, no. No can be spiritual knowing, a sense of knowing. The gift of righteousness was given so that we would know or sense within us what is actually right and wrong. What is actually right and wrong in every situation. A gift which unbelievers do not have because they only live by their conscience. So for us, you have conscience and the gift of righteousness which is a deposited in our spirit being. And if we really yield to the spirit within us, there will be a sense, and hey, this is right, this is wrong. And that's wonderful. 
Because it's an unlimited gift of righteousness. As I said, it can be your relationship with angels, your relationship with God, your relationship with food, your relationship with money, your relationship with time, your relationship with other people, your relationship with those in authority, your relationship with those under you, your relationship with everything. You now have a gift, a sense of what is right and wrong. And the key is to be able to yield to it and live it, to work it out in our lives. It was not given just so that we have intellectual pleasure. It was given so that we could live our lives up. We could actually do it. We could actually have it as a character in our being. And that is righteousness. And you will find this expression in the Bible. The fruit of righteousness. Even in the passage that was read just now in, in Micah, if you go to the next chapter, it talks about how that it corrupted the fruit of righteousness. So, the fruit of righteousness has always been spoken about. Philippians chapter 1 also talks about that. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 was a prayer. When Paul prayed for the Philippians, that their love will grow in discernment, and then he talked about them growing in the fruit of righteousness. It's a fruit. A fruit comes from a plant. A plant comes from a seed. The seed was planted into us when you were born again. And that seed needs to be nurtured. And the seed of righteousness has been spoken up also in 1 John. See, every author speaks, about, Paul speaks about it, John speaks about it. He talks about how the seed of God is not in us. And the seed of God is such that it will cause us never to sin again. And yet we do sin, yet we do make error because we're not sensing the fruit as we did. Uh, let's look at the book of Romans 6. After Romans 5, you'll receive it. Romans 6 tells us now in verse 18, having received righteousness, see righteousness uh, is not so that we have a good relationship with God. Righteousness is so that we can, it's more the outward performance. See, in chapter 6, it's outward performance. And uh, that is one part of it, yes, in the sight of God, through the blood of Jesus. But look at how the direction of the righteousness. The righteousness is not just towards God alone. But it says in verse 13, chapter 6 of Romans, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness, to sin. But present yourself to God as being alive from the day, and your members, that is your body, as instruments of righteousness to God. That means our body will now yield, our bodies which are the instruments, will yield to the seed of righteousness in us. It has to grow as a plant, bear fruit, and in the outward working. Notice, righteousness is not just between us and God. Because that's what many people call that. Righteousness is how it flows through our life in relationship to everything in this life. And, uh, and it can grow. And, and if it is a fruit, a fruit can grow. There are different degrees of growth. And in fact, uh, hold your place there. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1. And um, in Paul's prayer, and I want to show that in verse 11, it is a plurality. In verse 11, being filled with their fruit. Can you say that? It's a plurality. Plurality means that there are a thousand and one, of course, uh, there's just a thousand and one, million and one, means unlimited. When you have, let's say, acquired a right relationship with food. You have acquired one area of righteousness. When you have acquired right relationship with money, you acquire a second area of righteousness. When you acquire a right relationship with uh, time, you require a third area of righteousness. When you acquire a right relationship with your uh, uh, brother and sister in your home, in your sibling, that is 
one area of righteousness. When you acquire a right relationship with you and your mother, that is a fifth area of righteousness. And once you acquire a right relationship between you and your father, which is a totally different area of relationship and different skills needed, it is a sixth area of righteousness. When you, and there's some areas you don't get to acquire because you're not there yet. But when one day you become a father or a mother and you learn how to relate to your children, it's a seventh area of righteousness. Can you see there's no limit? Righteousness is a relationship and each relationship has its own laws, its own protocol. And because it's so many, it's so confusing, and you know, one of the problems with this planet Earth is we run things, we have to run things by the law. But laws keep accumulating. Because people keep finding loopholes in law. Then you've got to close this loophole, then that loophole close another. And, and so there's no end to the making of laws. There's no end to the making of laws. And when those laws become so heavy, it become a burden. So God has shortcut the process. He created a gift of righteousness so that it be quote unquote instinctive. You know it. You know it. it's like something deposited inside you. So he has given a process, but we need to yield to the process. So understand that fruit of righteousness is fruits of righteousness. We can grow into it. And uh, so having understand that, we come right back to Romans 6 where we took off from verse 13. We are to yield our bodies as instruments of righteousness to God. And uh, then we go further to verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey? Whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. You say, how can you talk about give a change then? Talk about as if they knew wrongly they don't have righteousness because here it needs to work out through their life. Notice the key word is to obey. But this time your obedience is not from the law that you read outside. This time your obedience is to the soft prompting of your spirit man. Your spirit man, which has the gift of righteousness, whispers. But like one old Christian song says, sometimes the world and every of your emotions and your and your and yourself scream, and then we ignore the soft prompting of the spirit man. The whisper. The thing is, our spirit man doesn't scream or shout. It just speaks softly. It's so easy to ignore. But if we learn to yield to Christ in us and the Spirit in us, all, to, before you can obey, you must hear, correct? How can we obey unless we hear? And thus we need to hear in our spirit. And our spirit will always there. This is the assurance. Many of you might have made mistakes. All of us might make mistakes in various areas. But if you re-examine your life, and you look back at every place where you have heard and look at it carefully. The spirit went did whisper. Except we didn't hear and other things crowd the hearing and we obey other voices and not the voice of our spirit man. But if you always obey the voice of the spirit man, even without without trying to understand every single nuances and every law of heaven and earth, you will already want righteousness. God has made it so easy to give of righteousness. So that's why I say it's important to hear the give of righteousness speaking. And then we look on here in uh, verse 18, having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Not only are we hearing but we surrender absolutely. We're not even negotiating with our spirit man. We are not even trying to reason our, our spirit man. Our spirit man says something, we say, ah, no. Slave is obey. When the spirit man gives a whisper, come out and say, yes, sir. That's what a slave is like. They just obey. 
And that's the way we should yield to the gift of righteousness in our lives. And then, in verse 19, which is where we are taking off from. I speak in human terms, Paul says, because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now, he says, present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. And that's another level. So righteousness itself is already wonderful. Righteousness in itself brings harmony, brings health, brings healing. See, when you walk in righteousness, healing results because you know the laws of natural, laws of the soul, laws of the spirit. You walk in harmony, you have good health. They got so many benefits. Righteousness, you study the word righteousness, you find righteousness leads to well, well. Not just help, well. It's a righteous man that's always blessed. Because God sees the righteousness and says, I know you will be a will be good steward of all the power, authority, and money I give to you. And so God blesses. Righteousness is so wonderful, already so, so marvelous. But holiness, is one step higher. Holiness is different from righteousness. You need to start from righteousness to go into holiness. What is holiness? Holiness, the root word, whether uh, it be in the Greek or the Hebrew, the group, group, the root word, it just means set apart. To be set apart. An example that we have taught before on holiness is that some things may be right, it might be okay, but holiness says go one step further. Go one step further. And uh, so when you take an extra step further, then that's holiness. It goes beyond righteousness. And uh, that's why we are trying to understand what holiness is. And uh, notice, in uh, the natural we illustrate, in the book of Numbers, and we want to point to the difference between holiness and righteousness, so we give an extreme case. Uh, not Numbers, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, uh, chapter 10, Aaron, two sons, died. Their names were Nadab and Abihu. That is a disaster. Very few people have two sons die at one time. They are. And we do uh, empathize with you. If anyone of you have lost loved ones, we're sorry. And we know this painful. And here, these are the two top signs. And if you read Exodus, God keep talking about, you know, Nadia and Abihu must appear together with the elders because God has chosen them. So these are chosen sons. These are the two older sons of uh, Aaron. But they did something wrong. Bible says in chapter 10 verse 2, fire came out from the Lord and they died. And then God talked about holiness. Here's where you understand what holiness is. Of course, they were in unrighteousness because they didn't observe the law of God. But at the same time, they were also in uh, uh, lack of holiness. When you are in unrighteousness, you're automatically in, in uh, unholiness. Because holiness includes righteousness. Doesn't exclude, it includes, you have to be righteous to be holy. It's just like um, um, but it is why uh, you need to know ABC in order to form words. And the ABC is whole, righteousness. You need to know the relationship before you go one step further. How can you go one step further but you don't even know the fundamentals? And how can a person learn about uh, the law of giving when they haven't even learned the law of tithing? And uh, so tithing, people struggle with 10% and 
Don't talk about giving more than 10%. Uh, and so the law of giving is above the law of tithing. The law of tithing is the minimum uh, static. And uh, so here, they definitely were in unrighteousness and automatically they will have any unholiness. They died. Wrong relationship, didn't know all the laws of God, and it was three. God said this to Aaron. And don't forget, that's his brother also at the same time. So Moses must have felt it emotionally too. I mean, this is his uh, two nephews died. Says, this is what the Lord spoke saying. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. Aaron held his peace. So Aaron held his peace. And then these instructions were given to Aaron. When they came and carried the sons. Moses said to Aaron and to Eliezer who now is to replace the two sons. In verse 6, Moses said to Aaron and to Eliezer and uh, Itama, his sons, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, lest you die and wrath come upon all the people. Let your brethren and the whole of Israel bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. For the anointing all of the Lord is upon you. And it did according to the word of Moses. Now here is where you see the difference between holiness and righteousness. There was nothing wrong to cry. And who said it wrong to cry when someone died? There is nothing wrong to have a funeral service. Somebody actually died. Your own two sons died. There is normally nothing wrong to go to your house and, and comfort your whole family. But Aaron was told you cannot even leave this place. And his wife cannot even come to him. What was that? Holiness. One step higher. See, holiness is where it's okay for everyone else. But not for you. Because God says, this is the holiness I require from you. You serve me, you're set apart, I require you to go higher. Now he can cry later when he's on duty. But he cannot cry when he's on duty. Tell me whether it's easy or not. Hard. Tears want to come out. And if he grieve, she died. Don't you think it doesn't look bad from the human side? Of course it doesn't. That's holiness. And among other things in the priest, this Old Testament, not New Testament, New Testament, all things are forgiven in Christ. In the Old Testament, the priest was not allowed to marry a divorced woman. Specifically mentioned. Nothing wrong with people with divorce and then they remarry. I know out there in the internet and many people hear this message, I'm going to make it very clear. Your past is your past, you don't want to look into it, it's all in, under the blood. You should not reach through the blood to try to uh, look at it. You just, just go from the present to the future. But in the Old Testament, what was okay for the people was not okay for the priests. So obviously holiness is higher. It goes beyond natural. Because now God says, you must be holy. And that's where we want to start off from on what is actually holiness. What is holiness? We, we have actually defined righteousness. It's the harmony with everything. Very simple. You know. Laws are created to have harmony. Traffic laws, red light, green light, yellow light is created so cars can flow smoothly. So if everyone obey them, by default it should not be any accident unless the lights fall, of course. 
They are there to create harmony, good relationship. But what is holiness? And then I ask another question. Not only what is it, what is the essence of holiness? They say, what is holiness? Some of you will reply that maybe can answer. Set apart from God. What is the essence of holiness? And uh, before you answer, I'll just take the liberty as you're thinking. Read some scriptures to see whether you can find clues what is the essence of holiness. So let's start from Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. When God, through the angel, appeared to Moses in the bush. After the appearance, and you see the word holy all over the place in the Bible. After God called Moses and Moses said, here I am. First thing God said in verse 5 through his angel in the bush. Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals of your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. <coughs> What's happening here? That means the area around the bush has not become holy. Dust is dust, rocks are rocks, bush is bush. But the area now around is not different from the other bush next door. Something has happened. What, what makes it holy? What causes it to be holy? What's the essence of that holiness there? Presence of God. Presence of God. Very good. Now slowly coming up with your definitions. Is it the presence of God? Then the question, is the presence of God everywhere? Manifested presence. Wow, now no accurate. Manifested presence of God. So is it because the essence of God is there? That is different from other places. We all know that degrees of holiness is a really building. There's a holy place and a most holy place. That imply the degrees of holiness. There are actually degrees of holiness, just as there are many fruits of righteousness. There are degrees of holiness. Where we always throw, you know, pound up on our head. Be holy! Be holy! You know, just be holy! But then if we don't explain what holiness is, how will everybody gonna know? And then they go out from church and say, what is holiness? And uh, how to be holy? What is the essence of holiness? Today you will go out with those answers. By 12.30. <laughs> Which leaves us exactly 25 minutes more. But let's read one more scripture. So let's see whether... Uh, so from chapter 3 verse 5, Andy is already surmising for the 11 day fast cup meal. It's my very quick now. A lot of talking today, right? Okay. And so there you go. Manifest, he said, presence of God. Then I caught him and said, everywhere got presence of God. Manifest presence of God. Very fast. But is that it? So what happened to the bush? After the angel leaves the bush. I mean, the angel is not going to be stuck in the bush all the time, right? Until now, there should be bush there. So what happened after the angel leaves the bush? Is it still holy? Now that the manifested presence of God has left the bush, based on your, 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 your answer just now, right? You said manifest presence. What happened when the manifest presence has completed its action? And it is reduced to normal presence? Is the bush still holy? So the question for Eddie today <laughs> is is it holy or not holy after the manifest presence? That's right. And be careful how you answer. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the clouds forming under <laughs> light, under stroke, uh, lightning stroke. Uh, oh, back to neutral. <laughs> So you could not answer the question whether the bush retains the holiness or not. Couldn't, right? Now if we couldn't, means we haven't found the essence of holiness yet. 
still a puzzle. Because when you understand something, you can quantify it. If you cannot quantify, you never understand it. It's just like trying to discover what makes uh, uh, something burn. It took them a long time to discover its oxygen. The, the experiment until they realized there's one particular gas. Without that gas, nothing burns. Oxygen. But there's so many gases, nitrogen, abundant laden, there's oxygen, and carbon dioxide, and other kind of gases. You have to isolate which one helps something to burn. The essence of it. Well, let's look at the next one. See whether you got more clues. The more you read and bring it all together. Uh, Exodus 22 verse 31. 22 verse 31. And God says, You shall be holy man to me. You shall not eat meat torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. So God says, anything that dies by itself, torn by dogs, you know, don't eat it because I want you to be holy. Say, how does that relate to holiness? Now, how does that, whatever definition has to be true for every scripture, remember this. A good definition has to answer every scripture. A partial definition can only answer part of it. So we need a definition that can answer every single verse where the word holy occur. Whether in Hebrew in the Old Testament or Greek in the New Testament. But when you take that verse by itself, it looks health diet. That God is saying to be healthy and to be more hygienic, to be more conscious of this, looks like holiness. So we know now, we are like, we are like circling the bush. So this morning, we are literally beating about the bush. <laughs> Slowly circling for the kill. Sorry, but not so much kill. Huh? Slowly circling so holiness don't kill us. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so we have found that okay, holiness has to do with the manifest presence of God. That's not bad. That's progression made. Now I read another verse, and that verse seems to do with health loss. It seems to clean cleanliness loss. So now we say, hey, holiness has something to do with uh, uh, being healthy, being clean, and hygiene. Well, let me read another place where it seems to do with hygiene. Of course, uh, God also did tell them, which of course uh, I didn't want to bring up this subject, uh, because God did tell them that whenever, you know, they all live in a camp. And when you are outdoor and you have about 3 million people, the question is also, where is the toilet? Everybody cannot decide the toilet shall be behind my tent because behind your tent will be in front of somebody else's tent. <laughs> it's obvious, right? Everybody cannot create their own toilet behind their tent because it will be somebody else. Your back here is somebody else's front here. And God said, all toilets outside the camp. God did say, all toilets outside the camp. And God also say you must bury it. Don't just leave it around for somebody else to step on. That part is either by me. <laughs> Obviously, because you got to bury it. But then God says, because I am holy and I am in your midst. It doesn't mean that God is going to step on somebody's shit, right? No. Okay? Obviously, He's talking about higher law. He's talking about some sort of cleanliness. But how does it relate to holiness? And so we bring another scripture. This time let me throw in uh, Deuteronomy 23 verse 14. Deuteronomy 23 14. Chapter 23 verse 14. And I promise that we will have the definition done by 12.30. Now 15 minutes more. First time we have come down to the sermon. Very few times we have. Chapter 23, verse 14. It says, and this is the part that I mentioned to you. It says that every one of you must have an implement so that you can bury your refuse. It says in verse 14. For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to give your enemies over to you. 
Therefore, your camp shall be holy. No toilets within the camp. Then, and it says, he, that he may see no unclean thing among you and turn away from you. So of the three million people, if somebody just make their toilet in their own camp, we need a camp finish. And then Moses will pray, Oh Lord, why are you not visiting the camp? Lord says, somebody did business in the camp. He was very specific, all toilets outside. Now, here is where wrong teaching can come. Does it then mean all toilets are not holy? Does it mean that now our church toilet is quite clean outside there? That you step from here, the altar of God, you move, every step you take is less and less holy. And then as you near to the door of your toilet, and there's a door of the toilet, as you cross over the threshold, you're in unholiness. That would be horrible because that is true, they cannot speak to you in the toilets. For some of you, I know you do your meditation in the toilet. <laughs> and you read a Christian book. And sometimes I feel humiliated, right? Somebody could be reading my book in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's alright. That's good. That's, right? that's alright. Uh, rather you read my book than you read any other thing. Or right? <laughs> uh, these papers in the toilet. But it would be wrong to imply the opposite. Why you can imply that holiness has to do with hygiene and cleanliness in a physical? It is wrong to imply the opposite. Because not everything is an equation. Some things are arrow, one direction. And you cannot reverse it. Just like uh, Stephen Hawking calls time the arrow of time. Because it goes forward. Up to now, no one has traveled back in time. And, uh, you can see the past, you can record the past, and I believe, you know, in the spirit you could observe a lot of things, but you couldn't go back and change the past. It's an arrow of time. So obviously this instruction is one way. So the toilets will still be holy unto the Lord. Of course in the New Testament, that is even more in Christ. There are a lot of things in the Old Testament, I will make a note here. There are a lot of things in the Old Testament that were unclean. In the Old Testament, if a lady has menstruation, they were considered unclean. It took quite a long time, longer than a man. Because men don't have menstruation. But imagine unclean. Do you know what unclean means in the Old Testament? Anyone touch them also become unclean. So you can imagine if a lady has a normal Monday, she has to walk in a circle of uncleanness. Anyone go near, touch her, boom, they're also unclean. So he also isolated, quarantined. It's Old Testament. Doesn't apply to New. And the New Testament, if a man has an admission, or even if he has a sexual relationship, as long as there's an admission, also unclean. For a day. And there's so many laws of uncleanness, but all this thank God done away in Christ. And how is it so? And that time when we were in the house and we were talking, and then God gave you the vision, remember? And that when Christ was born through the book canal of Mary, He cleansed all the whole process. And Christ being a man also cleansed all the things. In Christ, all these unthinkable things have been done away. Which means that whether you know you're a lady, you're heavy, you're money or not, you can still serve God in holiness. Hallelujah. Old Testament cannot. And all those things are declared. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, the marriage bed is holy, it's sanctified, it's undefiled. New Testament. Different. All your relationship become holy as long as the husband and wife. Sanction in God. So Something has been changed in Christ. But then, here we are still stuck and we only got 10 more minutes. <laughs> now for the first time you wish a sermon longer. Oh, give me the answer with me before I go home. Yes, at 12.29. We're slowly coming to the definition. What is holiness? What's the essence of holiness? And uh, let's look at another verse in Leviticus 10. Chapter 10. 
And these verses are chosen so that you begin to see how your definition can be formed. Because we cannot read every verse, obviously. And that's where the one we mentioned in chapter 10 was true. God saw a defined holiness a bit here. Chapter 10 was true. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. Hey, I'm giving you clues here. That verse has some definition coming up. Oh, still didn't get it. Yeah. Anybody? Anybody coming up with a definition there? Just from that verse. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy before all the peoples. Uh, the Lord said. And uh, there is uh, some clues um, to the area of holiness uh, that God gives here. And uh, from there, you notice that holiness relates to God Himself. And there, that phrase that was given in seven thunders, when you bend down to write down, only Yahweh is righteous, only Yahweh is holy. Of course, only Yahweh is righteous because only He who created everything, you know, the laws within everything. Only He is holy because all concepts of holiness relate to Him. You know why angels are holy? Because they carry the presence of God. So actually, there's only one being in the whole universe that is holy. God Himself. The I am the I am, the one who is self-existing one. Look at the definition of holiness. Set apart. Set apart for who? Correct? Set apart for who? Now, I had to give you the definition by 1225 because it got three points to cover. <laughs> but I will give the point in summary and cover in detail, second service. Part two. So, obviously, it relates to only God. Holiness is something that flows from God. And then it affects those who are near God. Like Aaron. Because he's nearer God, he, a higher standard is required. And it affects it, everything else. Let me throw another verse in, chapter 19. It should be more and more able to define holiness. Leviticus chapter 19. It says here, and here's another interesting story. Talk about trees and plants. Leviticus 19. Verse 23, 24. When you come into the land and have planted all kinds of trees for food, then you shall count their fruit as uncircumcised. Three years it shall be as uncircumcised to you, it shall not be eaten. Verse 24. In the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy. A prey to the Lord. So what's the difference from fourth year fruit from third year, second year? Fruit is fruit. How is that that the fruit is holy? What makes it holy? Well, now we're very quiet. Eh? Honoring God. Yes, honoring God. Coming up slowly. Definitely honoring God. It's an honor to God. So then we come back to Eddie's first definition. Manifest presence of God. How is the fourth year manifest presence here? Was there no manifest presence on the tree in the first, second, and third year? Can you see how our definition can answer some verses but cannot answer another? And another cannot answer. You need one definition that can answer every verse when the word holy comes. Then I'll give you a last one because we have to give the answer quickly. Some of you are really wriggling. Give me the answer! Okay, okay. Uh, 
Okay, please. Chapter 27. He talked about tithing. And it says here, um, in chapter, the last few verses of chapter 27, verse 30 on West, 30 to 34. All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants at all to redeem any of these tithes, he shall add one fifth. In other words, he shall pay 20%. Concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock or whatever passes under the rod, shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. If he exchange it, both become the Lord's and is holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments that God gave. In other words, if you're if you're shepherd, a cattle, first man, you have to give your tithe to the Lord, you count the animals and they pass one by one. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then ten goes to the Lord. Then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten goes to the Lord. You cannot purposely arrange so that all your fat animals go between one to nine. And then the weak one, one legged, one eye, blind, and about die, old, about time to go, got only three more months to live, you push in as number 10. And, and also, if number 10 happens to be one of your favorite, really nice, juicy cow, <laughs> if there's such a thing, and is it, why I like this cow so much? I uh, exchange, I thought cow is cow. And it changed. God said, you try to change. Not only the original cow is his, the one you exchange also now becomes his. So you question, how is it that he says his tie is holy, and then now you can use the English expression, holy cow. <laughs> what makes the holy cow? How is it that number one is not holy cow? Number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you cannot say holy cow. But now number 10 is holy cow. How is it holy? And then the next one, number 11, the cow, you say, if the cow will speak, I'm not holy, don't look at me. <laughs> and then you count, number 20 says, I'm holy cow. And he goes to the side, belongs to the Lord. If you only knew what was waiting for him, <laughs> the priest in the time. <laughs> What makes the cow holy? Ah, here's the answer. The essence, see, there is only one holy. God, include the Trinity. Holiness, and this is the essence of holiness. you never find defined anywhere else. It takes exactly every scripture, looking through it over and over again. See, simplicity sometimes comes from complexity. But it takes like, I've got a complex root. It's a very simple definition. We all miss it. Holiness just means you belong to the Lord. God says, This is not mine. That's it. Holiness, the essence of holiness, is that God now has ownership. That's the difference between cow number 1 to 9 and cow number 10. That's the difference when, 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 uh, the archangel appeared in the, in the bush, spoke to Moses, and God says, This bush is not mine. I put my green there and my ownership. So we can answer the question it remains holy until whoever defiles it. And they will have forever judgment, and then it remains defiled. See, God, when He puts His ownership on something, then it becomes holy. Now, meditate on this fact. That the essence of holiness is, it now belongs to God. 100%. 100% of the number 10 cow, holy cow, belongs to God. Now, what do we mean when we say, Lord, you're holy. Most people think of holiness as righteousness. That's why I've got to remove that definition. See, most people think coming near to God 
He's holy. I must abide by all His laws. Correct? They only think about holiness in terms of righteousness. They have no understanding of holiness yet. They only understood righteousness as holiness. Which is normal. It's, it's normal for a little child to understand uh, adult concepts in the wrong way. And, uh, you know, a little child who hasn't gone to puberty, haven't understood about how babies are made, or take, you know, well, mom and dad marry, then baby comes up. Doesn't it come that way? Because they cannot understand adult things. And so in the same way, there are uh, greater understanding. When we say, Lord, you are holy, we recognize He's, he's Him. He is always holy. But when we say, Lord, I want to be holy, next time you say, I want to be 100% yours. Mean what you say. When you say, Lord, I give something to Him, do you know immediately it doesn't belong to you? You have released your ownership. And that is why in the book of Deuteronomy 26, there's a verse that says, when you have taken from your, your house and removed from your house the holy tie. The word tie is in italics because it's not really, but the holy, it implies the holy things of the Lord. That doesn't belong to you. It must not be in your house. You must remove it to where God has his own storehouse. Because you don't own it. That is why God says, when you count count number 10, immediately it's his. And when you try to exchange something that belongs to God for something that belongs to you, even once it was yours, once it tie it is God's, and you try to exchange it, God said, hey, what are you trying to do with my thing? Not the other things will belong to me. Because God has ownership. The essence of holiness is it now belongs to God. Now, let's move it into three-point teaching, which I will just outline. Out of that comes this understanding. Everything we have came from the Creator. Now you understand why God wants for you. Everything that in this universe, everything, the air you breathe, the life you have, the money you earn come from the gifts and talents that, uh, that uh, uh, God has given to you. And even the concept of money, I'm sure angels must have come from God and inspired into the heart of man the invention of money, the invention of it. Every good thing that happened on this earth, God inspired in some way. God gave so freely. God doesn't have to give. He gave us life. He gave us the creation. We are His creation. And this is where the concept of holiness comes. God wants to look around and see anyone Give it back. This is the concept. Anyone says, Lord, I belong to you. You give me life. You give me creation. You give me the existence. I don't give my existence back to you. That's where the concept. Don't think of holiness as unselfish or selfish. Holiness is a is the is us just coming back to God because He gives us who we are. Give us everything. And he, is, he, he wants us to start with little concept of ownership so we can understand it. Like the tie becomes holy. Why? The, when you give the tie, or you bring the tie, you can't give something that's not yours. You bring the tie. The Bible always say, never say, give your tie. Bring your tie. It's because you're learning the concept of ownership. God owns this planet. And he just said, give him something that represents and acknowledge him as a and learning 10% and learning your whole life is 100%. And out of learning that, there are three principles to learn that. And you see, I go to the Bible for lack of time. Number one is the principle of thanksgiving. The minimum you want that God looks for is thankful heart, thanksgiving. And He condemned all those humans in Romans 1. Those who may have revealed the knowledge of God, they were condemned because the Bible says, after God created them, God gave all this, they were not thankful. So, out of the lack of thankfulness, they fall into many other sins. And the original creation, which Pastor David saw, was the creation rejoicing in a friend that is created. 
They can joy that blood came from God and thankfulness that flow. So out of that comes the principle of thankfulness. And it goes deeper than that, uh, which we teach in second service. And then another step that God looks for is the principle of love. If you cannot say, Lord, I love you, at least you say, Lord, thank you. You've given me life. But then God looks for those who can say, you have given me life, I'm thankful. I now want to love you back. And for that, God has a special place He created for all His creation who love Him back. Without, without any, uh, uh, not just chosen people, but, but everyone is free to love Him back. But He knows not all will love Him back. As you see the judgment of the seventh thunder. These are people created by God. The fallen angels, these are angels created by God. Their life comes from God. God could snuff them out at any time. But God did not. The devil is not saying, thank you God. But the good creation is saying, thank you God. And then the second level, God looks for is saying, I love you Lord. First Corinthians chapter 2 says, God has prepared something in the universe for those who love Him, love Him back. The something He created, human eye hasn't seen, human ear hasn't heard, nor human heart has entered. But what God has in mind for those who love Him back. See, this concept ties to holiness. That will be the second level. And of course, there's a third level, which is your say, not only do I love you, I give myself to you so that you has a hundred percent control of me to teach others about you. God has, uh, uh, you, you, you surrender your rights. You surrender back everything God gave you. And say, Lord, life is yours. Everything is yours. You know, some people, they love God. But God is not their Lord. But number three is the Lordship of Christ. And the Lordship of God in your life. 100%. And then there's a higher level. So again, what is the essence of holiness? God's ownership. But in His ownership, how do we learn holiness? How do we become more holy? And the three steps. First, learning to be thankful. Second, learning to love God. We first love, of course. Third, letting God be 100% God of the world. Then we can understand concepts of holiness. But it all ties together. And we'll talk more in the second service. But you can see now also how people fall away from holiness. You begin to fall away from holiness when you stop being thankful. When you stop being thankful. You begin to think that you are your own boss. You own everything. And you forget the original concept. Original concept of holiness, God owns everything. So we are so far that we think we are our own man, we are our own woman, we are who we are. And you start being proud instead of humble and thanksgiving. And Secondly, when you stop loving God, then the Creator and, and the creation no relationship. The creation are not in the right relationship with God. Holiness cannot flow. And of course, thirdly, a lot of people would receive, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, love God, love God, love God, but they hey, it's still mine. But God looks for his creation and say, it is mine, you have given it to be me. To, to, to me, I give it all back. <coughs> and God is pleased even with That's why God loved Abraham so much. God gave him a son. And the act of Abraham giving him back the son was very powerful. So, holiness is ownership by God. That's God's holiness. Let's go to God in prayer. 
Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask of God that you teach us holiness. As we learn the perfect holiness, whenever we say, Lord, we are holy, whenever we say, Lord, that we yield ourselves to you, whenever we say we want to grow in holiness, now we understand. It's to learn to grow in letting you have greater ownership of us. And to respect that ownership. That when it is given to you, it's given to you. It's no more ours. Just as when you gave to us, you gave to us so free. So free that Satan and, and humans have rebelled, taking ownership of things and, and even denying your existence for humans. You are so generous, O God. Help us, O God. To love you with all heart, mind, soul, and strength, always. In Jesus' name. Amen.